It is still dark. I'm lying here with my arms crossed like I usually do. I don't know why that's my physical stance, even when I sleep. Always the skeptic, they tell me. Always standing at the back, observing and analyzing. I could see this whole thing coming. Over the last months, as we started traveling to Jerusalem, there were little signs that things were going to change, that something big was going to happen. Everyone was more tense. We watched our backs, even if we wouldn't admit it. Jesus was getting more resistance, and often the crowd took it out on his disciples. I'm sure there were spies around, and officials, and religious bigwigs hiding in the shadows. And even Jesus was talking weird, mumbling things about suffering and betrayals and denials. I just wanted some clarity, some evidence, some open discussion. But who listens to me? And now the whole dream has collapsed, and we are left to pick up the pieces. It is early morning, not quite dawn yet. The sun has not yet risen. It is still dark. I can't sleep. I just keep waiting, waiting for that sound that inevitably comes with the first hint of light. It is a sound that will haunt me for the rest of my days, each and every day. The rooster, the cock crowing, announcing to all that I failed, that I couldn't keep it together, that I even denied knowing him. I abandoned Jesus. I feel so guilty. Actually, it is more than guilt. It is shame. I'm ashamed to show my face to my friends, to the other disciples, as we try to make sense out of what makes no sense. I walk around with eyes pointed to the ground. I can't even make eye contact. Jesus had called me Peter the Rock. Ha, maybe he should have called me a pebble or something. It is early morning, not quite dawn yet. The sun has not yet risen. It's still dark. It's still dark. I can't believe he is gone. I love him so much. I don't think I have ever had anyone else give me as much trust and confidence. I love his support as Jesus did. He called me the beloved disciple. And now he is gone. Even when he was hanging on the cross, I couldn't believe it was happening. That Jesus would die. Until Jesus looked at me, standing beside his own mother, and said to Mary, Woman, here is your son. And then to me, here is your mother. Wow, what a calling. I will love and take care of her for the rest of my life. Jesus often talked about his own baptism, when a voice from heaven said, You are my son, the beloved. Now I am part of the family, part of the calling. I am beloved. It is early morning, not quite dawn yet. The sun has not yet risen. It is still dark. I couldn't sleep at all last night. To be truthful, I have been crying off and on since Friday. I just can't get that scene out of my head. My Jesus, suffering and dying on the cross. Jesus, he was so full of grace and forgiveness. You could see it, know it. Every time you saw his face, every time he looked you in the eye and spoke your name, and to see his face slowly lose its color and then its life, I will never forget that image. It was like I was transfixed. I couldn't move. I think I was the last one to finally leave. All the men had left long before, and now I had to go back to the tomb for him, to be with him. Somehow I must protect him, at least protect his body. Bring perfumes to show him honor. I need to be the first one to get there before the sun comes up again. John 20, 1 through 10. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and I don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in his place, separate from the linen. 
Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed.
have seen the Lord. Can you believe it? I almost missed him. It was like I couldn't see straight. First I had come to the tomb and the stone was gone. Panic. The body had been stolen. I must have come too late. I failed him. I ran and told Peter and the beloved disciple. My body was shaking. My eyes kept tearing up. I finally broke down outside the tomb. I just wanted to find the body. And then, and then, who I thought was the gardener speaking to me, asking questions. It was my name. He spoke my name, Mary. And I knew, right in that instant I knew. It was Jesus. I saw my Lord. He told me not to hold on to him. And now I don't need to. I feel so free. I can let him go because I saw him. I'm going to tell everyone I know. Morning is broken. I have seen the Lord. There was Mary Magdalene, who woke Peter and I, each drifting on and off before dawn. She was almost in hysterics. We just ran. We didn't know why or what to expect. It was like a foot race, and I had the edge. I got there first. I stopped suddenly at the edge of the tomb, half off balance, not daring to go in, just seeing the linen wrapping, wrapping scattered, scattered on the ground. I somehow knew that if I took another step, if I entered farther, my whole life was about to change. My mind flashed ahead to everything that could have happened. But there was something just beyond what my mind could fathom, something bigger and more amazing, and I couldn't quite grasp. It was beyond reach, unless I took that next step. Peter moved first, he always did. And then I took that step. And even the cloth from Jesus, Jesus' head, was neatly rolled up. The world had changed. I just knew it. Deep down, I knew he was alive. I saw and believed. Morning is broken. I have seen the Lord. I have seen him with my own eyes. Yes, these eyes. I am looking and seeing again. I can look you in the eye. It all happened so quickly, so fast. Mary just ran in, talking nonsense, but somehow drawing us, urging us back to the tomb. And it was empty. The linens and cloth just lying there. A part of me knew already then that he was alive, that something new and amazing and world-shattering had just happened. The world would never be the same. And then we saw him at the house. He just appeared, like nothing had happened. Peace be with you. Receive the Holy Spirit. We are just trying to pick our jaws off the ground, and he is already sending us out to the world. I would see him again. I knew he wasn't done with me yet. By the beach, he took me aside and asked three times, Do you love me? Of course I do, I blurted. By the third time, I knew that the rooster's crow would never bother me again. Morning is broken. I have seen the Lord. I didn't think I would ever utter those words. Even when the rumors started, the women were crazy in their delusions. The others also said that they saw him, even saw his pierced side and hands. All nonsense, illusions, daydreams, rising out of our collective grief. Let me touch the nail marks, and then we'll talk. This went on for a week. A long week, where I dared not entertain the possibility, even in the far recesses of my mind. And then he was right in front of me. He just appeared through closed doors. Peace be with you, he said. And he dared me to put my fingers on his hands and sigh. No more doubting. I stood there open mouth. I didn't even move a finger. His voice was proof enough. All I said. All I could say was my Lord and my God. Uh, at this time, if the ushers would come forward, we will take up our Easter offering. Uh, please give generously to the Lord God.
morning. Good morning. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. I'd like to thank all of you for getting up early to come out and join us in worship. Uh, that definitely means a lot to us. So this morning, I'd like to begin with a journey through Easter with the eyes of Peter, uh, somewhat as we've already seen from some of our readings. Uh, we begin with Palm Sunday. As a disciple, I personally would have felt elation, gloriously riding into Jerusalem alongside Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. Put yourself in the shoes of Peter, one of the disciples. You are walking next to the Lord, and everyone is screaming and praising, and there are palm branches everywhere. And can you imagine that feeling? Just being greeted by the masses, it seems like everyone loves you, everything's going well, everything is great. Uh, the excitement, the pride, and the beauty of the situation. Just imagine that. That was surely a great day to be one of the twelve. And a few days later, you gather in the upper room for Passover. This was probably another joyous occasion for the disciples. They were getting together to celebrate one of their religious holidays, and I'm sure there was lots of talking and joking and good times to be had. But then things kind of take a darker and mysterious turn. Jesus tells you that one of your own sitting at that very table would betray him. Can you think of how the implications of this, can you think of the implications this would have for you? you? You've known these guys for years. You've gone together ministering for years. You think you know them inside and out. I, I, would, I might be a little bit offended if Jesus told me that... Uh, one of my best friends was going to deny him that I thought I knew inside and out like this. And before you can even turn this over, God starts to uh, break the bread and pour the wine. Imagine how not knowing the context of that. Imagine what that would mean. Why is, he break, why is this his body broken? Why is this his blood? Imagine the confusion. And after this, before you can really wrap your mind around this, you go to the Mount of Olives with Jesus' words swimming in your head. Jesus begins to foretell that in the coming hours you will deny him. How could that be possible? You've seen him do all of these great miracles. You've seen him do all of these wonders. How could you deny him? You don't understand. At least this is how I would feel. Why would you deny Jesus after all you've been through with him? after all the miracles you've seen him do. But sure enough, he confirms that you will deny him three times. He goes to pray, and when he comes back, out of the garden emerges a group of Roman soldiers. Your heart is pounding. Why are they here? What did you do wrong? What did Jesus do wrong? What did you do to deserve this? Imagine how the fear that would be going through your mind. Judas kisses Jesus. And suddenly you realize it was he, your former friend, who betrayed your Lord. Can you imagine that? As soon as you realize this, you get mad. You pull out your sword and cut off the ear of the servant of one of the men. And then, but that's not where it ends. And then Jesus heals it. Why is he healing one of the men who came to arrest him? Can you imagine all of the confusion, all of the doubt? As Jesus carried them off, imagine the distress you would be in. You just rode into Jerusalem, and now they're just pulling him out. You follow closely behind the group, not wanting them to see that you're with him. As you go, you wonder if Jesus was really who he said he was. Why did he let this happen? Why did he let himself be arrested? Why did he not summon the wrath of God on the Romans to stop himself, if he was really God? What doubts would you have at this point if you were in Peter's shoes? At this, in the, as the joy of the beginning of the week turns into a disaster, Peter arrived at the house of the high priest, where Jesus was to be tried. Imagine all of the doubts. Even though you saw all the miracles that Jesus did, why would he let himself go through this? Why would he let himself be arrested? Wouldn't he have known not to come to Jerusalem? As you walk around, suddenly a girl asks if you knew Jesus. Take some time to think about what you would say to this, in this situation. Uh, 
Fear quickly overtook Peter, that's for sure. He didn't want to be known as one of the twelve. He didn't want people to know that he was with uh, the one they were going to probably kill. So he said no. Shortly after that, two other, two other times he was asked, and he said no again. Could you imagine how you would feel? Would you have said the same answer? At this, you see that uh, what Jesus said was true, and you are overcome with emotions. You fear for your life because you knew Jesus, yet you also have shame for denying him and not really getting to let him know that you're there for him even in the hard times. You are confused as, such a, as how such a triumphant week could become such a crisis in your life. You wonder why Jesus hadn't saved himself. Why wasn't he doing anything to get out? Uh, because of these feelings, you run and hide like Peter. You just, you don't want to be seen. You don't know what to do. Part of you wants to be with your God. And the other part is saying, go. You're going to get, you're going to get captured too. The execution of your God seems inev inevitable, the crucifixion. You hear that he's not defending himself. He's saying nothing in his own defense. He's letting himself be taken to the cross. Why would he do that? However, Peter remained in hiding. Would you? Peter didn't want to have to see his God going through the crucifixion, what some call the most painful death known in human history. He didn't want to have to be there for the potential nine days it could take to die on a Roman cross. He didn't want to be there when to see Jesus having to struggle, moving up and down nine inches with the nails in his hands and feet to see him have to breathe. Would you have done the same thing? Can you imagine these feelings, this fear, this confusion, this loss? And now that you're hiding, you think Jesus is gone. He let himself get killed. He struggled on the cross. You think it's all over. Will they come for you next? Are you going to be arrested now? It's been three days since Jesus was killed and all of these doubts turned over in your mind. How could he let himself die? Why did he come to Jerusalem? Why didn't he even defend himself at the very least? Why would he do that? Suddenly it's a knock. there's a knock at your door. Is it the guards? No, you open it and it's Mary Magdalene. The stone is gone and Jesus' body is not there, she tells you. You fear that someone has taken his body, just adding insult to injury. You run to the tomb and confirm what Mary told you, but now you are marveling because the clothing was still there. Was Jesus' body stolen? Was he risen? Where was Jesus? Just take a second to imagine how this would be running through your mind. Someone you were sure was dead is gone, not in the tomb. With a one-ton stone that was setting in front of it, and it's gone. Just imagine, just imagine the excitement and confusion you would feel for that, especially after the past three days of almost literally zero hope. Later that day, you're in the upper room, and Jesus appears. He appears. Think of that. That is incredible. That's, this isn't just a story. This is something much bigger. Just someone you think was gone, you don't know where he is, his body's gone, he appears to you. You realize this is what Jesus meant when he said the temple would be rebuilt. He found out that his beliefs, Peter found out that his beliefs were true, and he had no reason to doubt. But the shame was still there. He still denied God three times. The true message of the resurrection came to Peter later at the Sea of Galilee, after Jesus helped the disciples catch a literal boatload of fish. And Jesus asked Peter if he loved him three times. Peter replied yes every time. And he was forgiven by Jesus Christ himself. This is the meaning of the resurrection. 
It's God's love and forgiveness and saving grace. And that's how it came to Peter. And think about how much this contrasted with previous events. Think about from Palm Sunday to the Passover, to the arrest, to the crucifixion, to him being risen, to Peter being forgiven. Imagine all of the emotions. Imagine everything. And the great thing is that God overcame that. Think of how refreshing this was. But the great thing about this for us is that we don't have to walk in Peter's feet to see this. We don't have to pretend to be Peter because it's right here for you individually. It's not just for Peter. It's not just for me. It's not just for anyone. It's for all of us. So this love we experience is obviously incredible. A father giving his son, the only innocent person ever, to die for all of us is the greatest act of love of all time. This, must be the, this love must be the air we breathe. And God must become our rock and our shelter and our Lord. Because we can never repay the debt we owe for him dying. But the great thing is, is that's great. That's okay. God doesn't expect anything. It's unconditional. However, one thing I see many Christians struggle with is what to do with this love. And that's what I would like to talk about now. Uh, a lot of Christians just sit on it. It's kind of their foundation but they don't really do too much with it. That's what I see in my school a lot. They say, you know, they go to church, they're active Christians, it's just they don't really do anything with it. Uh, other, Christ other people try to hide it, like they put a cover over it. You know, they know it's there, they just don't want to have anything to do with it. They don't want other people to know they have anything to do with it. But this is not what God calls us to do with the love of Easter. There are essentially two parts to what uh, God wants us to do with the love of the resurrection. The first is for us individually to dwell on it and let God overflow us with it. He wants us to be filled with His love because He's got a lot more love than we can understand. Just think about getting overflowed. I mean, a lot of us have had a time where we've been overflowed with the love of God. Think about that time or think about how it felt, or even overflowed with anything. Just I like to imagine a cup and a pitcher. The pitcher's got a lot more. And if you pour all of that into the cup, the cup can't hold it. That's like God's love for us. We can't hold it all. But what we do retain, it's amazing. Uh, and then, he, he's the only one who can fill our cups. That's another thing that happens with the resurrection. God filled the void of sin. And he's the only one who can. The second part is even more beautiful than the first. And that involves, like I said, it overflows. This is what you do with what overflows. God calls us to share his love. Because there's plenty to go around. When Jesus is calling the disciples to go and spread love in Matthew 10, 8, he says to them, Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, now freely give. This is the calling that God gives us. Freely give His love. We have been given the power to do incredible things with God's unconditional love through the resurrection, and we can take that for granted. We can make a difference. Uh, 1 John 4, 7 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. That, that is a big verse. That is what the message of Jesus' entire life is. It's love. It's right there for us. As Jesus, as always, puts it perfectly in John 13, 34 to 55. A new commandment I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you... So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Jesus himself said that our love for him is defined by our love for each other. And that is really the meaning of the resurrection. Even on the cross, Jesus was thinking of others before himself. Even to death. He literally loved us to death. 
In fact, loving each other is only second to one thing, and that's loving God himself. As I have come to see, loving others is beautiful and incredibly rewarding. I have gotten a lot farther with it than I could possibly imagine. The abundance you will reap from life is incredible when you show love to others, whether it's through an organized ministry or just something uh, spontaneous in, at a grocery store, it's anything. Loving others makes you feel good. And this is a love that we must show to all, even when it is hard. We cannot pick and choose who gets it. Jesus did not hang on that cross for us to decide who gets his love. He hung there for us all to get it. And honestly, that is great. This is a source of relief. As much as we'd like to think we are, we are not fit to decide who gets the love of the resurrection. Jesus already did. Our role is actually rather simple as Christians because of the resurrection. All we have to do is love God first and love others second, and everything else will fall into place. And when we fall short, just remember to love God, because through the resurrection we can be forgiven. That is the message of Easter. That is why, this is why Easter is so important to us. Easter means love, Easter means forgiveness, and it is a love that we all must know, and we all must share. So with that, I encourage you to express God's love to all you see, and always dwell on the importance and reality of the resurrection. He is risen. Thanks, Sam. Amen, brother. The good news is this is the only time you'll hear me speak today, and it's going to be short, so can I get an amen? Oh <laughs> wait, my wife is not here, so there will be no amen. <laughs> good morning. I want to take a moment to thank all of you for coming this morning. I want to thank especially our praise team, who has been working extremely hard and has done an awesome job. I want to thank you, young men and women. <laughs> hard to get young people up at 5.30 in the morning. They didn't know I wanted them here at 5.30 because it doesn't start at 6.30, but we wanted them to get here. <laughs> so we thank them. We thank Sam for his leadership this morning and his bringing us up the, the, the message. I wanted to take a moment this morning to take a look. We've already heard from John in his, his account of that day, that day when the tomb was empty. But I wanted to take a moment to look at Mark's account. Mark has just the same account essentially, but he takes it a little bit earlier in the morning before those disciples started to head to the tomb. And he says in, in, in his chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, he says, When the Sabbath day was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought, bought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on the way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And they entered the tomb, and they saw a young man dressed in white robe, sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who is crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell the disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him, just as he told you. Slightly different account. John, in John, the stone has already been rolled away. But here we have some disciples who are asking, who will roll away this stone that potentially weighs tons? It's a question all of us struggle with. We all have stones in our lives. Stones of divorce, 
stones of sickness, stones of broken relationships. And a lot of times we want to ask that same question. Who will roll away the stone? Well, my friends, I'm here to tell you, as from this account of Mark, the stone has already been rolled away. The stone, when you look up, has already been rolled away. Not only because of your strength, but because of love, as Sam just spoke of, that is greater than any one of us could ever imagine. A love that ended on a cross, or began on a cross, however you want to look at it, whose life ended on a cross with a crown of thorns upon his head. My friends, the message of Easter is that that stone has already been rolled away. We need to lay it at the foot of the cross. And so this morning, as you enter, and I apologize, we had more folks here than we ever anticipated, which is awesome. We each, those of you who came early and got here, got a stone. And you should have gotten a Sharpie, or at least there's a Sharpie probably in the pews around you. I want you to take a moment to think about what that stone in your life is right now. I want you to take a moment as you think about that stone that's in your life to jot it down on that rock. Write it on the stone. Because as we come this morning to take of communion, and we're reminded of the blood that was shed for you and I, and we're reminded of the body that was broken for you and I, we are to lay our stones at the cross. And when you look up at that cross, the stone will be rolled away. No more shall we let grief, no more shall we fear what's coming tomorrow. Because we know that the God who died on the cross for us has already taken care of that. We know that the God who brings us here so early in the morning to celebrate his resurrection has gone ahead of us so that we can live free from the stones. So no matter the size, no matter how impressive the stone might be, no matter how heavy the stone might be on our hearts and on our minds and on our souls, that stone can be moved when we lay it at the foot of the cross. But that's not where it ends. When that stone is lifted, as Sam has already alluded to, and as the disciples continue on in John, as we read this morning, we must be prepared to go and to share how the stone has been lifted, how our stone has been moved. Because our Christ lives. He lives today. He lives in us and through us. And if we are not prepared to go tell others of how our stones have been moved, we have not followed through with his commands. My friends, we're here to celebrate the risen Christ. Not the Christ who was held back by a big one-ton stone, but the Christ who overcame the grave. A Christ that lives on forever in our hearts and in our minds. And so I ask you, my friends, as you come this morning for communion, to take a few moments on your step to write what your grief, what your pain, what your suffering is. And again, as you look up at the cross, know that the stone has been moved and that our God lives. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you this morning so filled with awe and wonder as we look at the grave. 
The grave where you no longer live. The grave that held you in is no longer able to hold you. Because you conquered death for each and every one of us. This week has been a trying week for so many. Seeing you at the Last Supper serve your meal, signifying the broken body that you have shed, broken for each and every one of us, signifying the blood that you shed for each and every one of us, and to see you hung on a cross to die. And God, the waiting, waiting during the Sabbath is so hard until that opportunity when we can run to the grave, wondering how we're going to get through everything that we need to get through to that big stone. How are we going to move the stone, Lord? But you've already moved it. Each and every one of us comes here this morning, Lord, with stones. Stones that sometimes seem too hard to handle. Stones that are too big to move. But we rejoice, God, in knowing that you can conquer all. That you can move the stones of our lives. That you are not afraid of the size of the burden. Because you have already taken that for each and every one of us. I just pray, God, that as we worship you this morning that you would fill our hearts with love, that you would fill our hearts with joy in knowing that we can say you have risen. We take joy in knowing that you are no longer in the grave, but you live. God, we thank you for this season of Easter. We thank you for the love that you showed us through your son, Jesus Christ. And we just pray that you would embrace us at this moment. Embrace us as we worship. So that we might feel your love. A love that is unconditional. No matter where we've been. What we've done. A love that covers all. Amen. I'd like to invite Pastor Scott up. He is going to be uh, Consecrate the elements of Christ. Blessed Easter morning to you all. <coughs> he is risen. As I was listening to Matt and to Sam, and I was thinking what a stone represents. Sometimes it's a burden that we have to carry. Come to a new realization uh, that a stone represents blockage, being blocked can't go forward. And I thought of a picture that came to my mind as like a, a dam that, that, that blocks the water from getting through. When you move whatever blocks a mighty stream, there is a force and, and, and there is just suddenly a flow that just, as, as Sam was saying, can't be contained. It just, it just is a new force in our life. And that's exactly what Jesus was saying that night. He said, in essence, you've been really blocked up. But I'm about to do something for you that's going to create a new arrangement. And you will have this new arrangement, the cop being the new covenant, a new promise, a covenant that I'm making that's going to free your life you are going to be free. And he said, and they didn't understand it, but we know we have the benefit of hindsight. And we know it personally. Those of us who are here, assuming all of us, have made that decision to have Jesus break our stone. And he said, as he broke the bread, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. And he took the cup, and he said, to their quizzical amazement, this cup represents a new deal that I'm going to pour out for you and what I'm about to do. My blood is going to seal the deal. 
And this is a cup representing my blood that is shed for you. Maybe they didn't get it that night. I don't think they did, but they, they did later. And we get it. And he said, drink this and remember my sacrifice. And the stone is, is removed from your block life. Let us pray. Father, I pray that uh, you will make this bread, this juice for us, the body and blood of Christ, the opening of free-flowing love, access with God. That God moves and flows, and his love flows through us, unblocked, no longer bound up by our selfishness and sin. God, let this be for us the Easter story that lives in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Now if the ushers would come here, we're going to have two places you can come down to and receive communion. to the table this morning, come as you're ready, but I wanted to remind you that in the United Methodist Church, this is the Lord's table. It's not the church's table, but it's the table of our risen Christ, and we invite all who are willing and ready to accept Christ into their hearts to come and partake. And as you come, bring your stones, lay them at the foot of the cross, and look out, knowing that the stone has been moved. Come as you rain.
begin to close here, uh, I encourage you to come downstairs and join us in a very good breakfast. So it's usually a pretty good one. <laughs> and uh, also I encourage you to come to another one of our Easter services at 8.15, 9.30, or 11. Uh, as we leave here, give Jesus that rock. He can, he's going to crush it into a million pieces and then throw it further than your eyes are capable of seeing. And then go help someone else do the same thing. So that's my uh, words for encouragement, and uh, please stand as we go out of here praising.